Okay, well, I would like to call the June 14th, 2021 Parks and Recreation Advisory Board meeting to order. Could we please start with the roll call? Sue Allberg. Scott Conlon. Jeff Ellen Bogan. Here. Paige Lewis. Here. Nicholas Novello. Here. Dan Olson. Here. I have not received any notification from Council Liaison Aaron Rodriguez, but I see he's not here. Great, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to approval of the agenda. Does anyone have any proposed changes to the agenda? Great, okay, then I just need a motion to approve. I will motion to approve the agenda as written. Thank you. Uh, second? Sure, second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. The agenda is approved. Okay, and approval of previous month's minutes. Does anyone have any changes to the previous month's minutes? I do have one addition, uh, um, amendment, and that is that Kathy Cron was not actually at the meeting. I'm sorry about that. I put her as present when she is not. She's always here in spirit. It's true. <laughs> Okay, seeing no proposed changes, again, I, I just we, need a uh, motion to approve. I move we approve the minutes with that change to Kathy Crone's presence or not. Thank you. Any second? Any second? Thanks, Sue. All those in favor of approving the minutes? Great, thank you. The minutes are approved. Okay. Uh, still no public invited to be heard? I have not received any notification. And I don't believe Aurora has either. No, Chair, no public invited to be heard as of yet. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and continue on to old business. Jeff, is that you? Yeah. Yep. So, uh, at the last meeting, we had uh, talked about tabling the uh, field trip discussion until we knew more about what the guidelines would be. We believe that uh, we can now transport people. Um, everyone in the vans at this point in time would have to wear a mask based on the transportation guidelines, but at least we can can plan the trip and and uh, move forward with it if the board still wants to do that. So, great. Okay, so let let's talk about a, a date first. And it, it appears that uh, three of the of the board members are going to be out in July. And so, would it be best mm -hmm. to look at trying to do the field trip in August during our regular meeting or what What are the thoughts? Makes sense to me. Is everyone available for the August meeting? What is the date you happen to know? August 9th. 12th. Or hold it, sorry. 9th, yes. August 9th. I will, not be, I will not be available, but that's all right. You know, I mean, you're never going to find everybody. So <laughs> I'm getting back into town that evening. So it depends if we're starting at our normal time. It should not be a problem. If it's earlier, I may not be able to make it. Would that be a normal kind of schedule or not? I mean, it's obviously going to be daylight. What is, how does it usually work? Well, we usually start a little bit earlier. Normally, we've tried to 
be on the road by 515 at the, the latest. So is there, is the evening the best or would it be better to try it on a, a Saturday morning or something? I'm open to either. I just, that day, I may not be back by five. I'm, I'm fine with, if I have to miss it, that's fine. Do we want to try for later in that week? I mean, we could do it. Who are you out that whole week? I'm coming back into town late on the 11th. So or 12th, but you know, I'll be there, yeah. I can't do that weekend, okay. sorry. If we're doing it later in the week, weekend, I can't do it. Well, I was wondering about maybe the 12th or 13th. 12th is great. What about staff with that? <laughs> would moving it to a different day that week work for you guys? The 12th or the 12th or 13th, is that what you said? I don't know about a Friday night as far as if we're going to invite council, but I could make right. any of the, the 11th or 12th or 13th work. David or so Steve? If, yeah. Yeah, I, I can make any of those times work. Actually, August works well for me. So um, July would have been a little more challenging but whatever works for the majority i can make work uh same here i can make those things work so what if we did that thursday at in the evening august 12th or not thursday but that's okay either way i play golf on thursdays <laughs> Maybe you could make an exception, just this one. <laughs> Your game won't suffer, Dan, I promise. It might get better. Who knows if I take a week off. <laughs> We're talking about a 5 okay. p.m. start because I won't be able to make it before 5 that day. I just want to confirm. I think that's what we are saying. Yeah, 5. Yeah. So we're saying 5 p.m. on Thursday, August 12th. Yep. And I get like a thumbs up. Is that in lieu of Monday's back. meeting then? You think that's in lieu of Monday's meeting or in addition to? I was thinking in lieu of, but we would just, so we'd have to notice it probably some way. Yeah. But. Does that mean anybody who's you from play the public golf on Monday. Can, can people from the public choose to join then? Yes, they would just need to provide their own transportation to the locations and we could notify on primary stops that we'd make. Cool. Okay. So, so if that is, is the, that, I'm sorry, go ahead, Paige. Oh, I was just asking if that, I'm just trying to look at all the little squares and make sure that looks like it'll work for everyone. I don't see anyone shaking their head. I, I can't guarantee I'll be there, but you know, it's fine. I may not, you know, I'm, I'm coming from Durango, so I don't know. So yeah, it's fine. Okay, well, let's go with that. If that works for staff. Any clue whether city council likes Thursdays? I have no idea. Okay. I will, I will reach out to the clerk's office tomorrow and let them know and just uh, see what feedback I get. Okay, good idea. If you run into something that none of them will be available, then let us know. We can think about okay. it and okay. if we need to make an adjustment. Okay. So then are we ready to talk about where, where we want to go? Well, that's, that's what I was going to suggest, Jeff, is that um, we don't need two months to plan the route. No, we don't. So we could certainly let the board think about it for the next month and talk about it in July or solicit your top 
five locations via email or whatever, and then just try to distill some common common threads. That might yeah. be the easiest way of doing that. But all right, let's do that because we did get comments from all the board on their suggested location. Um, so let's let's check with council and get their feedback, and then we can could finalize this at the July meeting, the locations. And I think Steve's presentation tonight may help inform some yeah, of that. I would agree. Great. Sounds like a good plan. Sure. I really appreciate you guys being willing to give some thought to what would be helpful for us to see and also taking our feedback into account. And Jeff, you'll reserve the van? Uh, yes. Thank you. Won't I, Aurora? <laughs> yeah, that was a code, yes. <laughs> yes, we will. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay. Anything else under old business? Nope. Okay. Let's move on to new business. And the first item is the Adam Farm property acquisition. So Dan Wolford, I think that's you. That is, that is. Thank you very much. Um, glad to be here, especially on this particular item. I think you've probably noticed that well over the last year, it seems it's been in um, the natural resources update, my update for, for the open space acquisition. Um, in your packet is a map that reflects the location of this property. Um, the Adam Farm property is um, located at 11684 Weld County Road 5 and a half. It's approximately 139 acres immediately. Um, that would be west of St. Frain State Park. Um, it's very interesting um, in this negotiations. David and I have been involved in this particular negotiations for what appears to be over two years. It's certainly been a challenge where they had a, a, a real estate agent that really wasn't communicating, if you will, uh, between the family and, and the city. And as a result of that and the frustration, um, the family's attorney jumped in and, and they uh, pushed out, if you will, the, the real estate uh, agent. And so we, we are now to the point where um, we are pretty darn close to having a signed purchase agreement um, with the family. So with that, um, there's about uh, six shares of oligarchy with about 100, we're somewhere in about 130 acres for a total of $5.5 .5 million. We worked very hard. Um, we, we tried initially to start with a GOCO grant to get some support and um, I think we would have been a lot more successful if state parks would have been willing to participate in this act, land acquisition. Um, that's not the case. So it, it would be our hopes that very soon we'll get that signed contract from the family and then we'll present that to city council. Um, again, the reason I, there's so much that needs to go beyond, go, go on after council signs this, because this property in, in particular is has been annexed in, in the town of Firestone. And one of the um, agreements, if you will, uh, with that annexation into Firestone, Firestone requested a first right of refusal. So now once we get council to sign off on this, we'll turn this back over to the town of Firestone to see if they really want to spend $5.5 .5 million to acquire the property. Um, from just general discussions that we've had, David and I both, I can't imagine that the, the town is really looking to come up with $5.5 .5 million for additional residential development that was earlier, you know, in the um, late 90s, you know, was anticipated as a, as a residential uh, piece of property, especially when we are providing potential recreation opportunity with trail connections to the St. Frank Greenway and a variety of other uh, amenities that could be part of that. Included in this um, 
acquisition, like I said, $5.5 million. Boulder County is participating in this with us. They are coming to the table with $2 million. So we're fortunate to be partnering with Boulder County on this. In turn, Boulder County will receive a conservation easement and hold a conservation easement on, on that. Additionally, we will be entering into a agricultural farmland lease with the family for 10 years. That's one of the stipulations. Um, they believe that they would like to continue with ag operations uh, for about another 10 years. So we'll see how that goes. Um, you, you know, the nice thing, it fits very well within um, the open space map is a community buffer. Um, it certainly fits well from an agricultural preservation perspective. It allows us to preserve yet another, oh, about three quarters to a, a linear mile of the St. Brain um, Creek. So with all of that, the only thing that's really kind of awkward, strange, that, you know, part of the negotiations that we all have to do with is that the family is now asked to retain about a, a total of 11 acres and four development lots. So again, once we go back to the town of Firestone, since this is in, in, in uh, been annexed into Firestone, and they hopefully will give us, tell us that they're not interested in the first right of refusal, then we have to go through their land use department and go through a, um, a subdivision exemption with them and break out these four, eight, these four lots, if you will. Um, and those four lots are shown on the other map that you'll, that's in your packet. So those are the lots that the family will then retain for whatever purposes they, they feel they need. And we've said, you know, from that perspective, they have four lots. They can configure them however they want. We will retain a conservation easement on all of these lots. Each lot will be limited to a single residential development not to exceed 15,000 square feet. So if you consider, you know, these lots, almost three acres, that would be a house, maybe some outbuildings, but not to exceed that. So with this, we're finally coming to a conclusion. Um, I think we're excited about it. The family's excited about it. I hope you are too. So we're, I will open this up for discussion and really look for a recommendation to go to council it would be our hope that we would have um, a signed contract by the family, hopefully by the end of the month. We'll see how that goes. Great, thanks, Jan. Yeah, looking at the map, it definitely looks like an important puzzle piece in the sort of larger protection ring up there. Yeah, Dan Olson. Uh, remind me, Dan, where does the trail connector to St. Brain Park? Is that on the northwest side of the St. Brain in, in this area or on the southeast side of the St. Brain? Board, here's where we're thinking. Again, it's all conceptual at this point in time. We've got the St. Brain corridor that goes under State Highway 119 that makes it in, in, into the park. What we would anticipate that we would have an east-west corridor, trail corridor from Union Reservoir that would go through the Herner open space, through the Newby open space, which is immediately to the north of the Adam Dairy Farm. And oh, then, those two, two and a half squares that I see on your map? Yeah, exactly. So it's more of an east-west connection from Union Reservoir along 26 or some way you know, along that corridor that would then tie in through the Adams um, farm property into St. Brain State Park. So there would actually be probably two connections into the state park, one being St. Brain Greenway, this other one being an east-west uh, connection. Again, anticipating that we will be building over the next few years that uh, loop trail around um, Union Reservoir. Thanks. The two... Yeah. One more question quick. The two residential areas immediately west and southwest of the Adam Farm property, those two squares, are they in Longmont, Firestone, 
Weld County, are they incorporated? Those are, in, both of those are, in, are, are, both of those are in Firestone, yes. So the little notch, if you will, in the Adam Farm property, we will be adjusting that and incorporating that 11 acres in their square and making some lot line adjustments associated with the subdivision exemption through the Firestone process. And, and uh, again, ideally, if you look at that, oh, I, you know, it's probably 35 acres just south and east of the Adam Dairy Farm, we'd really love to approach that landowner and acquire a conservation easement. We know that he's interested in, you know, building a couple residential units on there. It would be great if we could preserve the, the balance of that corridor um, and then, you know, limit development 200 feet from the center line or something of that nature. That would be, you know, another goal that we would love to do. David, did you want to add something? Yeah, just to, to Dan's question about where the trail comes in, one of the things that I think is a great opportunity is that this trail, well, the, the one from like the image from the south on St. Brain Greenway, tying into the state park and then heading out to the east too, that very naturally ties into that regional trail system then that, you know, Longmont has really done a, I think one of the best jobs of making every, all the pieces there. Um, those out and backs would be nice, but really does for Longmont residents is because I think a great potential loop opportunity to come in on the St. Brain, come up through the state park, head back around through that um, that union piece that Dan talked about through Nubia and stuff. So um, I, I think it just provides a lot of great opportunities. And Dan mentioned that protection of the St. Brain Creek. If you start looking at maps with the protection there, the protection of the state parks, the protection of Boulder County and the Lions, we have a significant, we have significantly those agencies protected the majority of the St. Brain Creek um, from I-25 up to Lyons. So I, it's, it's pretty impressive what this, this this acquisition does. So um, I also just want to thank Dan because he mentioned us working this for, for two years. This is the second time Dan has worked on this project too. So he's got a lot more time in this than the two years that he and I have put in. So well the other nice okay. thing about Thanks. from a from a trail connection too, it certainly will provide a regional trail connection in, over to Mead High School, which provides, you know, again, another safe option. I, I'm not familiar how you how familiar you are with Weld County Road 26 as it ties in, in you know, um, into um, County Road 7, but it's kind of crazy out there right now. And if we could do, provide an, uh, an off-road opportunity for whether it's uh, any kind of pedestrian traffic, we certainly know that um, David, and you can vouch to this, is, you know, some of the cross-country events or track events that go on, this provides yet a, another uh Pretty nice connection to the high school out there. Hey, Nicholas, did you have a question? Yes, thank you, Paige. Uh, so, D Dan, you mentioned that the property will be used for agricultural purposes for a period of 10 years. Yeah. So, how does that work with the, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about, you know, trail systems and regional trail systems connecting and uh, conservation easements. How does that, how do those two things interact? Uh, if, there's it's been used for agricultural purposes yeah uh, some pr probably some perfect examples of how the agricultural and the recreational trails uh, and the interaction there would be on golden farms property where the saint brain creek um, and the golden farms and the greenway are immediately adjacent to each other you know in, in that particular location there's a fence separator between those two and we've not had any difficulty or problems there. Another good example would be the most recent opening of uh, Spring Gulch 2 trail connection um, out at Union Reservoir that runs uh, basically from Ute Creek Golf Course uh, with the final destination being um, Sandstone. At this point in time, there's not a fence that separates the agricultural fields from you know, the Greenway Trail. Um, we're gonna see how that works. Generally speaking, you know, there's corn and winter wheat being planted out there, but we've not seen and don't anticipate a whole lot of problems. So this is again, another would be another opportunity where it would be um, located on the outskirts of the agricultural property so that we're not fragmenting the agricultural operation or creating a problem for the agricultural tenant that has to 
open and close gates or any of that kind of stuff. So um, that w is what we would in anticipate in the future. That's really helpful. Thank you. So just to make sure I understand that um, this agreement would, does not include any descriptions about fence line where that would be drawn on the map. Uh, the assumption is that the border or the perimeter of the property we use as uh, that's that trail connecting system. If if, if we decide to, to, to generally to speaking, that's that. correct. Okay, as long as it doesn't divide the ag agricultural property. Okay, thank you, David. You're muted. Yeah, and I appreciate Dan you giving those examples. And again, I think you Dan mentioned his setup to this. That one of the reasons is. Besides the buffer, the trail connections, the riparian really was the protection of agriculture. So we're always trying to make those balances um, to provide those recreational opportunities plus the agricultural piece. And um, Dan, I think we have some great examples here in Longmont, but city of Boulder, you know, trails and agricultural properties are very common. Boulder County has um, them as well. So it's always just trying to strike that balance. We um, can do as we said, is preserve agriculture in the way that's most economically feasible to the family, but also um, balance those other needs as well. So uh, I think we can get there. Dan, did the mineral rights come with this purchase? Or are no, they are the... separate? Thank you. Great question, Paige. Um, those mineral rights have been uh, removed from the property, separated from the property. Currently, there's probably six wells on the property. Um, Let's see if I could probably in the just below the Ian property is there's six wells. One's already been plugged in and abandoned. The balance of those are scheduled to be plugged in and abandoned. So we're anticipating that. But those mineral rights have been separated from the property. Any other questions? So, oh, yeah. Dan? So, Dan, what is it you need, would like from us? I'm looking for a recommendation that we can include to City Council for the acquisition of this property. Great. So, if someone, um, I think that would be great. It sounds like a really important addition. So, if someone would like to move that we recommend approval of this acquisition. I move we move uh, we recommend to follow Dan's proposal and recommend that moves forward to the city council. Sorry for babbling that one. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thanks to all those in favor. Unanimously approved. Thank you Thanks. very much. Appreciate your support. Yes, thank you. Thanks for your hard work. Okay, the next topic is the comprehensive trail system, which I believe is Steve. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I was hoping Dan was gonna drone on and on for a while because uh, this one's gonna be a little lengthy. Um, I, I put together this presentation. I've done this presentation to Prab probably four or five times over the past 20 years. Um, it's really hard. Um, I have mapped 37 different missing trail segments within the city. And I know of three or four more that I haven't yet gotten around to mapping. I was not going to give you a, because each trail segment gets about three slides. So I wasn't going to give you a PowerPoint with 130 slides to it. I wouldn't do that to anybody. Um, so I put together a slideshow, which Aurora is going to bring up for me. I believe Aurora, is that correct? There we go. Um, so again, if I'm going too quickly, if I am droning on, please give me feedback. Um, that will really help me. Uh, it's it's complicated. So we have two different capital projects that deal with missing trail connectivity within the city. 
PR083, which is the prim missing primary and secondary greenway connections. And that deals with the off street trail connections, essentially. And then the T105 project, which is, um, and it's now called TRP. Sorry, this is an old slide. It's PRO083 and TRP105. TRP 105 is missing sidewalk connections. So those are sidewalks within the street rights of way. And if you think about our trail system, we utilize both of those networks to move people successfully throughout the city. So this is, this is really the definition of the two projects, as I mentioned, design and construct gaps in the primary greenway and secondary greenway trail system, and then gaps in the city sidewalk system. So, what I've done is I've put together a um, sort of a list showing you what some projects that we've completed over the past decade. Um, you know, these projects, hold on, Aurora. I know I want to go fast, not quite that fast. The, these projects, uh, are often taken, they often take part in conjunction with other types of um, other types of projects, such as Kathy Crone's efforts with the um, the park rehabilitation program. Um, there's sometimes opportunities to fill in some gaps within parks with those projects. Um, the engineering staff runs the T105 project, and we meet several times a year to talk about different areas where we're trying to um, complete gaps. They're often, they have staff over there that are looking for CDOT grants. And so sometimes they'll sweeten the pot for CDOT by saying, hey, we'll make this off street trail connection. And so we'll get some CDOT money from, um, for a project that we weren't really anticipating, but it made it a better project for CDOT to fund overall the street improvements as well as the trail improvements. So um, it, it, it really comes at you in a lot of different directions. And so I'm happy to clarify that for anybody um, but go ahead, Aurora. Thank you. So this is a project. The next, next one is a project that was completed. Um, oh, right around the flood. Cause I remember I was working out when the flood hit, but this is rough and ready. Uh, the rough and ready greenway just South of mountain view and just West of pace street. Uh, we made a connection between the existing rough and ready trail along the, um, rough and ready ditch to a public trail that is spans between Ponderosa Circle and Independence Drive. And so um, that was a successful project that helps link uh, th this area where the rough and ready label is right now is actually now affordable housing. So I'm looking to build a bridge over the ditch to connect that affordable housing to this trail uh, in order to better safely connect uh, students who live in uh, that neighborhood, the affordable housing neighborhood to the schools to the west. Next slide. This was one where we built a trail from 15th Avenue down to Spangler Park. You can see there's a couple dashed lines. The dashed line to the northwest is a trail that's not even Spangler Elementary School anymore. It's now um, a Catholic um, elementary school, not elementary school, but elementary and middle school, I believe. Uh, but we wanna make a, a trail connection up to the school. Kathy Crone right now is looking to uh, bid and um, install a new bridge over the uh, Spring Gulch that runs through Spangler Park. And the developer who is developing that property just to the east of that pond will be building a trail, trail connection, not in that location, but they will be making a trail connection up to Baker Street, which will help serve, make a better connection to uh, Longmont Athletic Center there to the east. That should happen starting this year. Next. This is up in sort of North Central Longmont, 19th Avenue. Uh, Gay Street is just off the screen to the west. Uh, this is Northridge Elementary. Like I said, we built a trail that connects between Bragg, Tony, and Herman Places down to 19th Avenue, which provides a safer route for kids to get walk to school in that general area. Next. This is a trail that's just um, east of the park maintenance facility. 
Um, it's north of the railroad tracks and it's a connection from Sunset Street over to First Avenue. Um, the connection to Vivian Street was made with this project and this is actually currently being used as the RSVP St. Frank Greenway detour while we're building the RSVP project behind Left Hand Brewery. It'll be remaining in place for a couple of years while we're um, replacing the Boston Avenue road bridge. Uh, so this is it's proven to be a pretty important connection to route people around the same for Greenway while it's not available. Yeah, I've been on it two or three times already. It's working great, Steve. Good. Good to hear. Thanks, Dan. The, the little red line uh, connection there up to uh, the Bond Farm neighborhood, that's the Bond Farm neighborhood where we're going to be building a future small neighborhood park. Uh, that was city council decided that we don't need that trail connection. So they let the applicant out of building that uh, trail connection. So that won't be going in at this point in time. Next slide. This is a project that we built uh, with the, uh, the T-105 project. It's a sidewalk on the um, eastern side of South Sherman Street. And what this really did was help connect uh, the mental health facility there up to the existing bus stops and things up by Ken Pratt Boulevard. So this was a successful project that was completed oh, about nine, 10 years ago. Next. <coughs> Uh, this was a section that was missing, and I don't think I think a lot of people forgot that it was even missing. But when it was built, it was a big deal. This is on the south side of Ninth Avenue between Martin Street and Lashley Street, over on the east side of town. Um, I recall a number of times seeing people in wheelchairs and walkers and things walking in the travel lanes of Ninth Avenue because there was no sidewalk on the south side. So, this was a great project that we completed a number of years ago. That was really part of the overall way to move people around the city outside of vehicles. Next. We did a conceptual design at city council's request to see how we can best get people um, over the railroad tracks at this. Uh, this is North the Ninth Avenue along Spring Gulch. That's Concepts Direct in the bowling alley, really right. Well, it's really the bowling alley right in the center of your screen at the bottom. Um, right now there's a trail along the uh, northeast side of Spring Gulch that connects back in between Placer Avenue and Snowmass Avenue, but it does not connect over the tracks. There has been a social trail across those tracks for years. That's obviously alarming and, and, and dangerous. And the concerns are as we're moving forward with our quiet zones uh, efforts throughout the city that the railroad may require us to fence this off so people cannot physically get across the tracks to keep them even safer. So uh, we did a, a, a conceptual design of an underpass there and I'll, I'll refer to it later that it is not cost-effective as I imagined. Next slide. <laughs> and then we also did a conceptual design so far of the um, Oligarchy Ditch Trail, basically from the intersection of 21st Avenue and Main Street all the way down to uh, Mountain View Avenue using a series of alleys, uh, streets, and uh, going through Lanyon Park. So we've done conceptual design to that. So now I'm gonna talk about some projects that we've, next slide, Aurora, Aurora. Oh, I'm sorry, a couple more I added in here. This is uh, the Ninth Avenue and Hover Street improvements that we have done. We've done a conceptual design for all of this. We were actually able to build from uh, Third Avenue Place right there by Golden Ponds up to Allen Drive and built a sidewalk on the south side of Ninth Avenue over to the Valley subdivision. This was an area that was cut off pretty significantly during the flood and the residents of the Valley subdivision there just north of the Golden Ponds label really reached out to the city and said, hey, you know, we're out here on an island. We have no way to really safely walk anywhere. And so we responded to those residents' concerns. We're able to build a couple of good trail segments. Uh, the rest of this will happen probably mostly through development, but, but there might be some capital um, improvements associated with making these trail connections basically from the Home Depot all the way up to Ninth Avenue on the west, west side of the road. On the west side, nice, because yes. the east side's great, but it's a pain to get across. It's a pain to get across, and how many times have you pulled out to make a turn in a vehicle and not notice someone riding the wrong way in the sidewalk because there's only a sidewalk on right. one side of the street? Right. It's not the most, especially with the volume that that street sees, uh, it is not the safest way to do multimodal transportation through there. We should have sidewalks on both sides or side paths on both sides. 
especially if we don't have bike lanes, which Hover doesn't have yeah, the way. Hover, no way, right? Time. You don't want to be on that street on a bike. Yeah, yeah. There, we, it's, there's some challenging sections, but it's really something that we need to be looking at. Actually, the at the very southwest corner of Ninth and, and Hover, that development has occurred since this slide was made, and so part of that has been built already. But there are still gaps. Next slide. Okay, so. Here's where we here's where we are. Um, you know, other projects that have didn't have a slide, but that we've talked about have been St. Frank Greenway improvements, the Spring Gulch two improvements that uh, Dan alluded to from uh, Stephen Day Park down to Union Reservoir, and the the funding in 2023. Hopefully, if Council approves the proposed capital budget, is to make that connection start in 2023, 24. I'm sorry, 22, 23. Um, from Union Reservoir down to uh, Sandstone Ranch. Um, so there are, there are a lot of efforts based on trail um, design, but we certainly are challenged with all the other capital project needs that we have, as well as funding availability. So I'm just highlighting some of the unfunded projects we have right, Steve, that are on our me. radar. Go ahead, Dan. What do, I, what do I see that's highlighted? The I mean, I see a whole lot of red thin stuff. Is it the purple and yellow and green that I'm looking at here? Don't look too hard. It's 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 a it's a it's a map. Some of this is on our GIS layer, and so those red thin lines are just main main streets. The small purple ones are some old trail segments. So this graphic was really just meant as a. Uh, this is the city. We've got a lot of trails. <laughs> some some included, some not. <laughs> Next slide, Aurora. Save me. So um, one of the big ones that we are looking to fund in the next few years is uh, the Oligarchy Trail. Uh, if you remember, we've talked to you about the Enhanced Multi-Use Corridor um, project that we've council has adopted in the past. And 21st Avenue between Main Street and Hover is one of the main east-west EMUC corridors. And the Oligarchy Ditch ties in at Main Street and 21st. And so we were looking right around when COVID hit at doing a conceptual design for an underpass at Main and 21st that would allow a trail to get underneath that state highway, as well as allowing the ditch to effectively flow under the state highway. There's some concerns with the flows of the ditch from the ditch company, which we are a majority shareholder. Um, that project was delayed because of just different attention that we needed to pay on other things. So we haven't done that conceptual design yet, but I did do a conceptual design on the Oligarchy Ditch Trail. And um, this is, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this area of town, but uh, the Eagle Eye Care Center is just north of Tire Plus. Tire, Tire Plus is mentioned or labeled there. And so there's an existing, uh, we have a short stretch of existing trail behind Tire Plus, but it dead ends into nothing. And so right now people are um, walking in a muddy undeveloped area. And then the yellow you see there is an existing alley that we wanna transition into a combination alley and vehicle access point for just those homeowners. There won't be any other need for a vehicle to go down there except when you live in those homes, but we don't wanna cut those folks access off to the back of their lots. So um, we've done some public uh, efforts to reach out to them and we'll be doing a design in such a way that will allow you know, using pavement markings and different types of pavement to make it as clear as we possibly can that people in vehicles should expect pedestrians and cyclists through this area here. And that the Eastern end of this corridor is Collier Street and that's Lanyon Park. Next slide. There's just some, you get an idea, that's the tires plus in the left picture in the distance coming from the alley. So it's just sort of a dirt area along the ditch. Um, and it's just not a whole lot of developed area though people are using it and using it regularly. There was an, it actually just east of the tires plus in that gap there, there was an affordable over the past couple of years that uh, will definitely benefit from the development of this trail system in the future. Next slide. As I mentioned, it's a greenway and it's got a dirt trail in an alley. We've done the conceptual design. We have the land, roughly $232,000. Next slide. 
And then this is the trail idea going through Lanyon Park. You know, so continuing that alley that I showed you in the last project is up in the sort of top left corner of this where that orange car is. And then people will be coming through the park and then behind the ball fields connecting into 19th Avenue. Next slide. The Lanyon Park uh, master plan update does show um, us naturalizing the ditch between the baseball outfield and the, uh, and the ditch uh, to make it more of a native area. It's sort of an unused turf area right now. So in order to save water, um, we are looking to, so this project would probably incorporate that transition of the park into its design and construction. Next slide. Again, we can fit the trail between the ball fields and the ditch. The ped bridge that's over there, it was replaced in 2011, so it's relatively new. Um, and so the estimated cost is about $135,000. Next. Continuing down the oligarchy ditch, this is between 19th, 19th and 17th. There's an existing alley that's really, really tight and is used by Longmont Sanitation, but I don't, I've never seen another vehicle on it besides our trash trucks. It's really tight and it's really just for ditch maintenance. So we would utilize that court, that right of way to repurpose that into a trail that people can safely use. Next one. So there might be some power poles in the way. We need to build some intersection improvements at 19th and at 17th. 17th would be expensive because 17th Avenue where this ditch and trail would tie in, the safest crossing would be right there at the railroad tracks, which is where we're going to have a quiet zone project. So we would be have to coordinate with our quiet zone project as we move our way up through that corridor of town with the quiet zones that we've been getting federal money for our quiet zones. Um, and so we would need to incorporate at least the design of, even if we don't have the trail built, the design of a pedestrian crossing through there that would work with the trail. And so with all those improvements, we're looking at about $450,000. Next, I skipped from 17th to 15th because at 17th, you could sort of see the, um, we, there is not any land along the ditch for us to put a trail. It pretty much runs through all private backyards. So what the idea is the conceptual design shows is lamplighter drive through that cor corridor is to add sharrows, change some of the parking patterns, widen the sidewalk, make things safer for pedestrians to use as a regional trail corridor, but um, it would be on the street. It wouldn't be along the ditch. South of 15th, we have the opportunity to duck back in and be along the ditch behind these homes. And so that's what this project shows. Uh, 15th doesn't have the volume of 17th, so the imp there wouldn't be any intersection improvements there except for stop signs. Uh, and then we have, we actually have, well, the ditch company has this right of way. We might have to relook at the Legal, legal language in the ditch easement to know whether we can put a trail here or whether we have to change that easement, but we do have ownership of the property in an outlot. So this looks like it's something that we can definitely do. Next slide. And you can see that there's just a little bit of land there behind the, the, uh, the homes, um, but, but that would be safer than people traveling on the street. Next. And this one costs about $245,000. Um, there is an existing capital project that occasionally gets funded for that's improvements to the oligarchy ditch. You know, the city being the primary ditch uh, company shareholder, we have an interest in trying to make the ditch as functional as possible and as maintainable as possible. There are definitely through this whole corridor, there are some challenges with our ditch maintenance. So I, I would be working with, in the final design, I'd be working extensively with our operations folks and seeing if they wanted to put some money towards some ditch improvements that would make their maintenance of this ditch, um, would improve that. And also the ditch company, but typically the city is the one who ends up funding those type improvements. Next slide. And this, this is the same study, Mountain View Avenue right there is um, just on the north side of that, uh, of, of this slide is Spangler Park. And so that's where we're trying to get people down safely to Ninth Avenue. This is just, again, um, I referred to the bowling alley, which is sort of in the south, uh, the, I'm sorry, the very, very bottom, a little bit to the right of your screen. Um, we can't get a crossing over the 
railroad tracks or under the railroad tracks. It would be a multi-million dollar project to be acquiring land and working with the railroad. So what we've come up with is a um, people coming out of Kensington Park from the south would have to use the 9th Avenue um, right-of-way to get over to a different trail that would more effectively um, get them up to 12th and Mountain View and Spangler Park to the north. What this does is this design allows the quiet zone project to fence off whatever it feels it needs to fence off without adversely impacting uh, pedestrian connectivity, safe or unsafe, sanctioned or unsanctioned. So that's what the, the idea behind this design is. The gap is there's an existing trail there right behind the old community gardens. Next one. Those are just some pictures of, uh, of that quarter. You can see there's ample space to slide a trail in there between the ditch and the, and the gardens. Next. Same thing uh, between 11th and 9th. We can come in behind the Concepts Direct, which is that, um, not Concepts Direct, I'm sorry. Circle Graphics, uh, which is the business there just west of the, the bowling alley um, and fit a trail in there. Next. And again, this trail is definitely desired by the public. The Kitely neighborhood is that neighborhood and they are a vocal local neighborhood and they like to use our trail systems. And so we wanna respond to their requests. Um, because of previous council agreements, we would have to be on street between 12th and Mountain View. We couldn't follow the, uh, the ditch through that neighborhood, but I think we can do that through some signage and some Saros. Looking at about $440,000 to complete this section of trails. Next. This is a Northeast, I'm sorry, Northwest Longmont. Uh, you can see Dawson Park there. I'm sure the board is very familiar with Dawson Park these days with all the uh, stress on Lake McIntosh. This is an existing um, utility easement between these homes. Um, it's really just privacy fence on both sides and it's just sort of a corridor. It seems like a pretty easy place to put a trail and uh, would help get people um, to closer, you know, a more streamlined route to 17th. Now, when this was originally considered, the stoplight at Harvard and 17th didn't exist. Now, now that there's a stoplight there, that is the preferred crossing. This may be a less attractive trail to try to fund because, you know, we want people to cross at the stoplight because that's the safest place to cross. And so we, by putting this trail in, we might be guiding away from that. So we'd have to look at that before we would invest in um, pursuing this trail line. Next. Those are just some photos. Like I said, privacy fence on both sides, pretty wide, pretty flat, pretty easy. Next. We'd have to work with PRPA to, or the, the power authority to get an easement through there. Um, and it's about $55,000. Next. This is one that I've talked to you about before and has been in your packet. This is the Dry Creek Trail between Village of the Peaks and Sunset Street. Uh, the red is adjacent to Village of the Peaks and we, the city paid for them to build this trail as part of their overall development. Uh, the blue is a trail that we have a CDOT grant for design. And so we are working on design of that trail right now. And that trail would connect ultimately all the way over to Sunset Street. It's showing a little bit short in this graphic, but it would connect to Sunset Street. Next slide. Um, the nice thing is that there's a, a, a law on housing authority, affordable housing uh, development being uh, proposed just south of this new section of trail. We would need an easement from them, but they are aware of the city's desires and they have great, um, they have a desire to tie into the trail and, and be able to be able to move people, their residents back and forth east, west. Dry Creek's a really interesting trail because there is a nonstop trail with only one at grade road crossing from North 75th all the way to Sunset Street once this trail is done. So that's a, that's a pretty nice long trail section for people to move in and out this part of town. Uh, estimated cost is about $300,000. Next. And then just a couple sidewalk projects that are more in the transportation or engineering staff realm. And, um, but I still, keep my finger in that in that area just to keep track of what those guys are doing. Next slide. This is um, between Flower Bin and the 
Western access to those of you that cut through the old Walmart site to get to Village at the Peaks. Uh, I'm trying to think there's a new restaurant, New Mexican restaurant over there, but there's no sidewalk on the south side. You can see the social trail. I've seen people walking in the mud, especially when there's snow and sleet and, and, and runoff. So this is one that we do need a couple easements from these property owners. We don't have the right of way through there. Uh, I know this is on engineering's radar to try to fill in, but uh, we have not yet accomplished that. Next. Yeah, like I said, social trail, it can get muddy. It's needed. Next. Dangerous, improved connection to the shopping areas of Hover and Nelson, needs some right of way, about $35,000. Was that it? Okay, great. So that being said, yeah, I'm sure there's questions. And I, I, you know, I have a pretty good understanding of the trail system and the sidewalk system through the city. Um, I've worked on building a lot of it with, with other folks and um, have just been around here for a long time. It's hard to capture everything. So I'm happy to take this conversation wherever you'd like to go. Feel free. Jeff, it looks like you're the first one. Is that okay, Paige? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I guess my, my question, and if you said this already, I apologize, but like the last thing you just showed feels like it has literally nothing to do with parks or recreation. It feels like it should be a city roadway thing. Like we're, that's not near anything that we're in charge of. Right. I don't, I don't understand how that applies. Well, it does in that natural resources staff, we're not just looking at trails that are off street. We are looking at safe ways to move people around the city to be able to get to and from our recreational facilities and other facilities within the city. So we work okay. with our multimodal transportation planning staff. We work close with our engineering staff. Like I wouldn't be managing that project, that sidewalk. Okay. But I would support and help our staff okay. in trying to get that funded and approved. And we would have an engineer managing that. And your reason for being interested, you just explained. You're you're not just focused. You're not in charge of every sidewalk in Longmont is what you're no, saying. No, but if it connects things together, that's something you care about. Yes, the, the, the network. And like I said, there were 37 different projects I could have put in there. I think I fit like 15. So we can go on till we got till nine, right, Paige? So we can, we can go on. We've got more time. I got lots of time. We do not go on to nine. <laughs> you, Steve, we have until 733. <laughs> okay. I'm not that's asking fair. any more questions. That's all I want to know. But, but yeah, so, so that's, that's the mindset of the staff that work together on these things is how do we prioritize limited dollars and limited staff to try to maximize the benefit of what we how we make connections and the, the the dry creek trail behind the Longmont housing authority one is an example of what i was talking about that was thrown into a cdot grant to improve the intersection of sunset and ken pratt boulevard we got a grant but that made the grant all the more attractive to CDOT to fund because there was a trail component to it and so we're like okay yeah we'll throw that in sure that's great let's let's do that now and so the opportunity arose so now we're designing it and we're going to build it it's hard to prioritize what's the best one because each person in the city, depending on where they live and where they work, where they recreate, where they go, finds one more important than the other. So, um, and actually before you move on to the next question, one thing that I didn't mention is that the other challenge of this is that the PRO uh, 83 project is also to replace existing trails that are in place but are deteriorating that have been around for a long time. There's one south of Skyline High School that's an embarrassment that our triathlon uses every year that is asphalt and falling apart. And we have to hit that in the next three, four years and replace that. Um, and so that dollar wise and staff time wise puts some of these projects back later because we're focusing on the replacement of those things. And replacement is never easy because trails built 25 years ago don't necessarily follow the same federal and local requirements that we have now. And so um, it just becomes more complicated. So Paige, I'll defer to you. Any other questions, Nicholas? Thanks Paige. I think it's partially a, a question, partially a comment. So I definitely understand the challenge of 15 different uh, we've only seen 15 of more, 37 that you mentioned, right? Um, 
uh, certainly difficult to grapple, uh, you know, get, get our hands around how to prioritize which projects are should we move forward. Um, we did talk about at least one project that I feel like, you know, you even said it didn't make sense to move forward with the Dawson Park, uh, Harvard Street one. Um, so, you know, are there more like that the some projects that we can cut off that we know that we can remove from the list to help make making the prioritization easier because sometimes it's hard to pick which one of the tops but at, uh, at least we can pick which ones should fall off the list if that problem yeah life. if any there's one more maybe right. some of these things get filled in by the development as we're tracking them over time um but very few okay yeah i'm just trying to understand uh are there ways to make this very complex problem that we have and prioritizing which ones you move forward and which ones you should not a little bit easier to, to wrap our heads around? And if there's one or two that we can remove from the list, then that seems like a win in, in my opinion. So. I, I will go into the, the, the slideshow and in my files and, and mark that one as not necessary, but no, I haven't found one. And like I was saying before, it's just a matter of to prioritize. Everyone wants the one in front of their house. And it's hard to say which one is the most important. There's some that affect more. We're trying to focus on affordable housing development in the city. That's a conscious decision. And so I think some of the trails that we're looking at that do have connectivity to affordable housing complexes are good things. But that doesn't mean that other people don't have trail needs. So. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 we've come up, we've tried to come up with two or three different rating, like prioritization ratings for the different segments. And we've, we've landed on nothing. We've I was just going to ask standards. that if you had yeah. some kind of checklist or anything. We, we, we've landed on nothing. We've looked at national standards. We've looked at, uh, we've had a consultant give us some input when we were doing the uh, enhanced multi-use corridor uh, project. Cause this is just, it's been weighing on me. Like I would like to know which ones are most important. And it's, I don't want to be the one that says, just because I feel that way, that's sort of crummy. So I really would like to, and I've had public outreach. This project currently for 2022 is not have any funding, um, but we're looking at funding for 23 and beyond. We're trying to catch up as staff a little bit. So we're not proposing anything, any funding for PR 83 in 2022, but that doesn't mean we can't be looking at trying to get with the public to prioritize, but it all depends on who shows up the meeting. So, Scott? yeah, and that that's that lies the problem. I think <laughs> the people who show up at meetings are the ones that are well served already. So, um, I, I I love the uh, you know the the oligarchy part uh, of it, um, especially with the the city's ownership of the uh, kind of the right of way and of the of the ditch itself. But it serves people who are not going to be going to city council meetings. And so um, just just as a general observation, I'm not going to kind of guess they don't go to city council meetings. So um, so and that's why we I think that's where we need to look at prioritizing parts of the city that we don't address on a, on a regular basis. Um, otherwise, my, my question is, um, one on transportation side, we constantly run into issues, had run into issues that it's a it's a county little section, right? 17th, Boston, Sunset, perennially problem areas that the county doesn't fund for decades at a time. Is that does that exist somewhere, say like 22nd or something um, in the city um, for trails? Is there equivalent on that on the trail side? There's there's challenges, but we do talk with the county staff, Christine Overdorf and Tim Swope and those folks over the county that um, deal in their trails. And, um, you know, we just filled in a gap on the west side of South Sunset Street, just north of Boston Avenue, just south of our shop, just north of the convenience store there. There was a 30 foot section of trail, the sidewalk that was never there. And I told our engineers, we're using this as a detour for the St. Frank Greenway for two years, put an right. AM trail in and just put it in. And so they were able to figure that out and got it in. So yeah, there, there are things that we, Boston Avenue is a great example between uh, Sunset Street and the river where that's still county owned road and they had a project and then their funding dried up and they didn't do the project. There's no sidewalks on either side of the road there. There, the land is in the process of being annexed into the city. We are looking at some projects. And so 
it takes time, but we also, I think, have a strategy of letting development do its job. And as that land, as we move forward with RSVP, as that land annexes into the city, as that land develops, they'll be building the sidewalks for us. And that's what you know, council direction has sort of been all along is to let the development pay their way and for us to focus on areas that we don't have development opportunities. So not a, so, but yeah, there are, there are a few challenges. Another one is we are annexing some land uh, down on the uh, east side of, of Airport Road, way south down there where the Kanemoto Farms are. And so we're trying to figure out how that might affect the sidewalk, the 10 foot sidewalk on the east side of, of Airport Road, because we don't want that to be interrupted by development. So okay. we're always looking at that as development comes in, but where there's, um, there's a few challenges out there, but not quite as much as the road system. Can I ask another one? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so so um, as as a user or in like looking at the user perspective is can we can we put signs up on some of the side paths? Like, so let's just take Hover, the west side of Hover, for instance, well before the sidewalk ends at someone's house. Like it would be great to say cross here at Ninth Avenue rather than you're now stranded and you either frog it across the street or you go back up and you try to cross at night. It would just be nice to say the trail closed, like doesn't exist a hundred feet down this path. And there's several other places where you let the person make that decision safely rather than just cut them off abruptly. So you just hit Jeff's question, right? The nail right there on the head. That's, that's traffic. That's not me. I am more than happy to take whatever areas, and I know where you're talking about, and I'm more than happy to take whatever areas and pass that on to our folks and see if they want to install some signage. Right. But that's not something that natural resources really manages is the trails in those right, rights of way. I, I do make sure that we have trails at the end to make sure no one falls off into the abyss. But as far as the warning signs, that's not a bad idea, Scott, I, but I'm, I would have to pass that on to other staff. Yeah, I'm just saying like it happens on trails too, where it goes from an ADA compliant paved surface to like a social trail. And so it would be nice for somebody before they get to that that end to know that it's gonna end in a hundred feet or whatever. I'm more than happy to, yeah, send me some stuff over and I can look at that and I can help where I can. Okay. Great. Happy to. David, did you have a comment? No, I was just going to say, Paige is probably going to hear a recurring theme here that she could um, <laughs> chime in wherever she wants. But um, again, I think everyone's really fortunate that Steve being a resident in Old Town area and look at these, these smaller missing pieces, recognize how important that is to get kids to meet a lot of our equity pieces right now, too, that um, I was really appreciative people mentioned that, too. These are some of the people that don't always have time to show up at meetings and stuff, but to get them to meet that goal, the city goal of having parks and infrastructure and facilities and rec centers within 10 minutes walk from our um, community. So it, it is an important piece. Um, Steve looking at those for all these years, but also knowing that he's the one doing Clover Basin, he's doing the Workman Park, he's still working on Dickens. Um, and he also, uh, the piece he didn't touch on, tonight, there's also in that list that we want to prioritize. Um, I think coming back to this group with, you know, maybe staff takes a stab at it, but I think balancing with those those longer range planning pieces too, because Steve did talk about how do we get to Clover Basin? How do we partner with the county to get um, out to Terry Reservoir, maybe up into Lyons? How do we, um, we talk about how we get from Union Reservoir over to um, the state park. So there's a lot of those longer term, long range, large trails too, that have to tie into the work plan of our, our um, project managers right now. But um, Steve, I, th I think these small pieces, sometimes you're gonna say, well, why does that really matter to us? Because it does tie into that that real goal of equity sometimes, and um, they're important pieces. Um, I think there's sometimes people get really excited about those big long extensions that I I can get excited about too. But Steve does a great job of keeping us kind of focused on what we need to get people moving safely around town too. And it comes back to sort of what Scott was just saying is that it's a pain to run into a dead end. Like right. nobody, they don't do roads. And like Scott, that. I will make sure that you know we <laughs> pass that information. I think it's, right. that's a great. Yeah, that's definitely a great comment. Yeah. We can, we can There's some there. exciting things on the horizon. There's some development applications coming in north of 66, uh, west of Main Street. 
There's the Terry Lake Neighborhood Park parcel up there that we would be developing in the future. I've secured some easements up in that area to try to get connections up to Terry Lake. We've looked at the possibility of, of leasing the recreational rights of Terry Lake like we do at McIntosh and some other areas. Dan has done a great job of acquiring open space down around Clover Basin Reservoir. We've been talking with the county about connecting the Dry Creek Greenway that I mentioned that goes all the way from future Sunset Street all the way to 75th, underneath 75th, connecting into the county ASI open space property, and then hopefully connecting up to the Clover Basin Reservoir recreational area that we can get those rights. And so there's a lot of great things. It just takes a long time. And I'll be honest with you, we, we are little, we are still flood focused. I'm still flood focused. And so I'm looking forward to the day and I'm not flood focused anymore and the floods behind me, but I'm not at all there yet. Any other questions? Well, I think this does highlight uh, several of us, I think responded in terms of the field trip, just wanting to get a better sense of, you know, kind of overall trail connectivity, I think, and how things, how are those pieces fitting together? What's the bigger picture? You know, what are, how are we adding some of these? And I think it's interesting looking through, if you looked at these projects through those filters of like equity, safety, and then sort of return on investment, you know, there might be a small piece that leverages mm -hmm. a whole big piece of connectivity and um, sort of interesting to think about it through those lenses. Thank you. I, I seem to do this with Prab every three, four, five years, and I can do it again at any point. Always reach out. Like I, I know where there's gaps. I know we have some strategies. Uh, we try to prioritize as best we can, um, but we're prioritizing against a lot of other projects that we're doing too. So, thanks for your time. Oh, just finish them all, and then we wouldn't have to have this conversation anymore. Come on, <laughs> come on. You know, if you weren't golfing every Thursday, maybe you could help. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll go back to my recommendation for more project managers, but I'm not sure where that's, where that's going. Thank you, Paige. <laughs> okay. I Thank you so much, Steve. That's super helpful. I don't know how you keep all those bits of information and connections in your brain. Uh, anything else under new business? No. Okay, so we'll, we'll go next to discussing items from the packet updates. So this is, if anyone, any board members have any questions from the updates from um, both parks, open space and recreation that are provided in the packet, now is the time to ask them. I uh, just a question for recreation at uh, Union Res to see how the first was it month two months of the self pay has gone uh, and if there are enforcement issues that people aren't paying or uh, people are being honest about paying for their permits. I uh, I think we've only had them operational for a little over a, a week. Oh, and, okay. yeah, so they. They were installed, then we had some issues with uh, software and how it was gonna communicate with the, the company. First week so far, so good. Um, I will make a note and be prepared to respond at our next meeting about that, to have more detail after more time. Okay, cool. Okay. Jeff? Yeah, Nicholas. Uh, just, all right, thank you, Paige. So a quick question about the, the Lee Miller Park renewal. Um, so it looks like it's been in this status where there's no new updates and it's still kind of waiting for the design consultant to come back uh, for a few meetings now. So I'm just kind of curious if something we should be concerned about, whether or not this is normal for something to sit in this status for such a long period of time or, thank you. Yeah, I'll answer on behalf of Kathy because she's not, not well, she's here in spirit, but she's not here. Um, she, um, 
she's run into several challenges on another project that she has managed an active construction on. And so it's really been a city slowdown of that project. And so it, it, the consultant is acting fine. And so there, are, there are, haven't been any real challenges. It's just a matter of trying to juggle all the different things she's juggling and finding the time to get comments back to them to, for them to finalize their plans. You'll see the same thing with the Workman and South Clover Basin project stuff. I have had a meeting this morning with, uh, with my Workman and with the consultant for both of those projects. And we're still confident we're going to be moving dirt here by, uh, by the end of the year on Workman, which is exciting but it's been a long haul. It's, we've been a little bit sporadic here for lack of a better term. Okay, uh, thank you, helpful. Other questions? I have one question and I, I hesitate to bring this up and I'm really just looking for a short answer. <laughs> I see prairie dog management come up and yes, I'm wondering if you can just tell me what the city's policy is right now on prairie dogs and I mean it looks like there's management ongoing at several parks and properties. Yeah I can I can definitely speak to that. Um, we probably have almost 14 locations throughout the city that we're actively managing uh, prairie dogs that many of those include some of our uh, facilities some include um, irrigated turf grass uh, parks. Um, one in particular that we spend quite a bit of time on is prairie dog management out at um, the airport. So uh, what that includes is uh, installation of barriers to keep them from moving, um, you know, constant monitoring and, and mapping to see trends. The other component is um, an ongoing um, euthanasia, if you will, where um, the prairie dogs have moved into irrigated turf grass parks or places that we've already designated as no prairie dog areas. So uh, we use our PERC systems, the pressurized emissions rodent control, which is a carbon monoxide um, to keep those dogs out of those particular areas. Um, I think that pretty much wraps that up. And are you also relocating some? Excuse me? Are you also relocating some? It looked no, like. We are, uh, Steve's got a, a park development that's going on. And this is out in the, Steve, is it right if I say Clover Basin area? Yeah, no, in South Clover Basin Neighborhood Park site. Right? These guys know about it. Clover okay. Meadows is the park name. We've got a volunteer who's doing a passive relocation um, at this point in time. She currently has a permit from Jefferson County to relocate uh, dogs over there. Um, much of that is just timing and uh, the, the ability of when that permit is being accepted. But uh, that future park site is being um, tr totally trapped in, in uh, elimination um, and relocated then to Jefferson County. Yeah, and I, just, I would just add that I think that's a pretty good success for the city. Um, we have had such a challenge, and Dan can expand on this a bunch. We have had a lot of challenges of trying to relocate prairie dogs outside the county because nobody will take them. And so the fact that this volunteer, this group of volunteers were able to pursue a permit to relocate prairie dogs off of a park site where they wouldn't have been welcome because it's going to be, you know, a, a neighborhood park. Um, I, I think is a, is a good partnership for the city to have entered into. And so I'm, I'm very glad that that has happened there. Great. Thank you. Any other questions from the packet? Any items from staff? Jeff. So oh, I have, a couple of things. The first one is we can start meeting in person if the board is interested in that. But we could do that uh, starting in July. And one of the things that uh, David, although Paige and I remembered and not David, sorry, David, um, <laughs> is that we had talked about this tonight and that uh, we could either meet at the parks building inside 
or if people are more comfortable, we could meet outside and they've done a nice job of setting up a, a space outside of the building where we could also meet. So just wanted feedback on that. What do you all think about trying for an in-person meeting in July? I think in-person meetings are, are, it's definitely time to start doing them. I think it would be good for all of us board members to actually get to know each other a little better too. Yeah, I agree. Others? I'm up for meeting in person, but would only want to be indoors if everyone was either wearing masks or we all acknowledge what our vaccination status is, which I'm not sure how people unvaccinated, but I would, I'm not sure if everyone wants to share that status. So I, I will tell you all that we've got uh, four tables out back. We've got a variety of teak chairs and cushions. Uh, we actually wheeled out a 70 inch TV tonight anticipating that you might show up. So um, we're definitely ready if you want to meet outside. It's got a tarp and a canopy over, and it's, you know, even though it is uh, 95 degrees outside, it's very pleasant. Um, the, last Friday, um, we interviewed um, for the volunteer coordinator. We did all the interviews outside. It was a very pleasant outdoor experience. Yeah, and I would just add that as staff, we've started meeting in person again, and I can't tell you how nice that has been to actually get to sit next to somebody and and see their full face and and really have the ability to yeah to interact. So I think it'd be a great idea, and we can make it um, as safe or as comfortable as everybody wants it to be. And I really missed interrupting you all without Paige's permission. So I'd really like to meet in person again, <laughs> but I will be gone out of town for uh, July's meeting and I could log in if it's online, but I'm going to be far away. So I won't be there if it's in person. And you can call me to interrupt anytime. Oh, <laughs> so I'm Dan, I'm not sure how we're going to do that. Jeff, um, I don't know if we, how efficient that is, but I think this new world we're living in, um, there's definitely some efficiencies in having options, but Jeff. <laughs> no, that. Yeah, you already said that. I'm fine yeah, with that. A couple, a couple of months ago, yeah, we were told that once we start meeting in person, the virtual part has to go away. I'm it does. Fine with that. Yeah. Okay. Really? Yes. Uh -huh. In okay. fact, the board passed a motion in, in accepting that uh, emergency statement. I think it was in February. When yeah, I was gonna say February or March, Jeff. I yeah. remember yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. So let, we'll move in that direction. Again, if somebody feels uncomfortable with this, please please let us know. The, the other thing I just mentioned is um, recreation facilities are back open with no guidelines at this point in time. Uh, masks are recommended if uh, people have not been vaccinated, but we do not ask whether they have been or, or, or haven't. Um, starting to see our numbers uh, bump up, which is great. And Sunset Pool is just going crazy right now with no guidelines. I, I would say we're easily back over 500 people a day. So that's been really nice to see again. So that's all I had. Hey, hey Jeff, can Thanks, I ask a Jeff. question real quickly? Yep. Um, is, are the activity pools not opening? I was walking by Roosevelt this morning and it wasn't full. They are not opening because that was part of uh, budget cuts. And so we will not open either one of them this year. Just a reminder, we had a uh, little over $1.1 million in cuts and trying to keep the facilities that can serve the broadest uh, parts of our community open. So those, we had decided to keep those closed this year. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. Any other items from staff? David, Steve, Dan, yep. 
Go ahead, Dan. With COVID winding down, we are winding up, obviously, as Jeff has just said. So we are anticipating um, stepping up the master plan for Button Rock Preserve. Um, and I'd love to get some feedback from the Parks Board. Uh, we anticipate probably one more uh, public meeting in October. And we would like maybe it, it, either in October or November, do a joint board um, with a presentation of the master plan recommendations with the parks board and the sustainable advisory board. Their typical meetings are, I believe it's Wednesdays um, at like three o'clock. Uh, we, we felt it would be very positive to have a similar presentation to where we could address issues and um, the parks board could hear from the sustainability board and, and likewise they could hear some of your concerns and comments we felt that that would be very beneficial. We would then take everyone's comments to the water board and then go through uh, the process of taking this to council for probably a study session and then adoption. But I'd love to hear your thoughts about maybe an October or November joint presentation with the Sustainability Advisory Board. Could we invite them to our meeting? I think I'd have a hard time with a 3 p.m. meeting. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why I'm asking. You know, um, we certainly could do that. Um, we'll reach out to them too for, for feedback. But if, if I know that the vast majority are not available midday, mid afternoon, then we could ask them to maybe come to our board meetings. What do others think? I mean, I'm definitely up for you know, having a joint presentation, but I wouldn't be able to make it at three. I'm in the same boat. Yeah. So that's three, at least three. Dan, you don't count. You're never working. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Any other comments about that? Okay. You? Just to clarify, so you're saying there's no more public meetings. This will be when they come and recommend. What we're, what we're doing is anticipating one more public meeting to present a draft plan to the public and to solicit one last time feedback from, from the public before we draft a final draft that we will present to the advisory boards and city council. We've done, I believe, three public meetings already and four citizen surveys. So we believe that we're in a good position to wrap up the public process. So this meeting you're talking about with the two boards would be that final also public meeting, yes? You know, again, all these meetings will be open to the public. So this one will be targeted specifically as a presentation to you and the um, Sustainability Advisory Board. Okay. Sounds good, thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Any other items from staff? Okay, any items from the board? Dan? I have a list, I'll try to put them together. So first for Dave Bell, uh, we've been going to Lake McIntosh a lot because it's close to the house. The boating is awesome. There's a zillion people there. It's great. I'm, I'm, I'm moved over to that side of the equation. It's great. However, uh, la the last two Saturday nights, there's a little old lady who for years has swum across the lake. And she's still doing it. And there are now kids who swim all the time in the lake. You mentioned a month and two months ago that we were gonna have more patrols or a boat or that hasn't yet started. There are no signs that say no swimming. I'm not gonna say a word to anybody, but there is swimming there. I don't, it's a problem waiting to happen. So Dan, I, I appreciate that. And that, I think the public safety side, I know there's been a lot of impacts neighbors. There's been challenges to wildlife. I think we're trying to address those with, we've, I'll just lay out a litany of things we've been able to do. 
Um, this year, we were able to get the wildlife closures up much sooner to help protect that western shore. Um, we have increased trash pickup um, from Monday through Friday. We now have a weekend group doing it. We're actually going to be installing some new trash cans out there. We have signs. That's good. So um, my next note was yep, on the trash Sunday is evening in. when you walk by, the trash is, there's a nice it's pile everywhere. next to and everything. They pick, it up, they pick it up Sunday afternoon. I'm not sure. It's just amazing. Yep. So we are, we're working on that as well. Okay, good. We have requests in for additional budget requests for the boat and additional seasonals next year. Um, Dale Rademacher has said, if I want to try cutting the line and say, this is important enough, we'd like to do it this year, he would support that. So that really was probably the boat and additional rangers was a 2022. We put it in the budget. I do have two additional rangers that are out there, but you got to remember, Dan, those are the same two rangers that are covering, covering kids jumping off Dickens. They're covering all the other parks. They're covering the, the camps along the creek. So they do get out there. And um, I'm even having my Button Rock seasonal that goes up to Button Rock every day stop in there as wait up and down just so we have that additional piece. As far as signs, the city's in the middle of branding changeover. So this has been a much more complicated piece than it typically would be. But I think we have the signs that will be in English and in Spanish. They'll have the new standards. Um, PD has been working with on it, our branding pieces. So I, I think we're really close as a Kathy piece. And Steve might have a little bit more information, but I have seen the mock layouts. Um, so those signs will go up and they will have the no swimming in it. And um, they will have the people have to have a personal flotation device on, device on it. We don't have that in our rules and regs, but our rules and regs allow us to force a sign that has been um, put up with Dale's recommendation or signature. So we will be able to enforce that um, once those signs go up as well. So um, we definitely have work to do out there, Dan. Um, and one of the pieces that I, I think Dan Wolf will probably saw today too is that, you know, that 25 boats, like I said, it's just, it's just unenforceable. No. And, Totally agree. I agree. So I, I think, you know, if we can try addressing those other things by having extra patrols, signs, um, we're getting there, but we're, we're not there yet, Dan. No, and I don't mean to complain. I'm oh, I know you're not. You're doing know good. what's on the ground, yep. what's what's the feedback. It's popular. I, I appreciate awesome. that. Yep, I appreciate that because, um, you know, we try getting out there, but having people that use it and can give me that feedback from a different perspective always helps. So, okay. And Dan, I would say, do not hesitate to call either David or myself or even Steve for that matter. You yep. don't have to wait for a board meeting in order to do that. If you see things that seem to be out of place or need some help. And well, I was going to ask Dan. At, at some point it's policy. At some point the city council gets to decide what is okay or not okay. Or, you know, I mean, it's not for me or us, this board to decide. I'm just letting you guys know what I see and maybe that has to go up the chain. I don't know. So, and again, I think that's what we're trying to do is we recognize that some of those changes we were able to put in for the budget, they need to happen sooner than later. So Dale, I, I do think I do have my um, chain's support on that. It has to fit in the bigger piece, but hearing it from this, this group helps a lot, Dan. Yeah, and I'm glad you're doing the garbage because it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's cute little neat stacks of boxes and cans and all right next to the garbage can. There's just a lot of folks visiting. It's really and I, I looked at that too. And Dan, this is another piece that probably come on this conversation that uh, Timber just found out about tonight. As I look at that trash there, because of the type of use and date, a lot of that is cans and bottles and stuff. And I'm, I'm asking to have recyclables. Yep, that would be good so, for a town like I, us where it's so right. easy. Yep, I saw way too much stuff that could be in a um, recyclable container sitting out on the ground and overflowing. True, true, cool. Okay, can I go on, Paige? How long is your list? Uh, I got two more items. All right. Well, so the go next ahead. one is for Jeff. Um, I've gotten a couple of feedback things at Sunset Pool. It's very popular, as you already mentioned. Folks, I think, are used to the one hour swim thing. Uh, now, lap swimming, people go for as long as they please. There is a backup. Uh, people don't want to do any more than two per a lane. And uh, it looks as though you have to wait, you know, is, and folks are swimming for an hour and a half plus. Is there any policy or is that fine? Do we need a sign? In order to get more usage, 
should we be limiting it to an hour or not? I don't know if this is a policy you guys have. Just again, we, pointing we could out. Look, we could look into that. It's news to me that we're limiting things to two per lane. You know, we've historically we haven't done that. But no, no, no. It's not a. It's just a de facto limit. Go yeah. by and look. Okay, I will now, do that. People split lanes, but nobody circle swims unless you're in a team, Masters or Kara, or it just doesn't happen. Okay. In my yep, experience. I'll, Sue, do you have any experience there? Do I'm going to say, swim? what time of day are you even talking about? Because Oh, this is the late morning, 10, 11 a.m. Okay. I mean, I'm not seeing a problem. I think people are sort of in this mode, oh, I get one hour. So I'm actually seeing people waiting like, oh, I can't get in. I personally have never felt like I had to wait to get uh -huh. in. I mean, I, I think that, I think people got in that mode the last year that I get an hour and I have to wait for someone to get out. But I don't know how to spread that, you know, make that clear. I, I've not seen it as a problem myself. I've not okay, seen I people. I just got feedback today that yeah. Right. So so that's, that's why it's on my mind. Sure, there's right. probably a couple people. So somewhere, um, I don't know what people would read to sort of get that information in their head. I don't know where they would go to get that information, but there's they should be asking the lifeguard and the lifeguards and the front desk people should know the answer. So I would say that that's probably the best place to, okay. to make sure they're very informed. Because there's Again, probably just pointing something out, there. Jeff. Just yep. letting you know. I will, I will get with staff and look into it. Okay. I I have a recommendation on that same topic. Oh, that's okay. I feel like when I used to swim in the swim in the rec center, which I haven't in a long time, especially when it was at the regular rec center when there was only maybe two lanes available certain times when they had the other part for aqua activities, yeah. there were people that would not be willing to do anything other than splitting. And at some point I felt like a sign went up that said something like, if there are people waiting, you need to circle swim. And I've definitely seen that in the Boulder rec centers. And yes. so I would encourage little A-frame signs that actually give the etiquette. If we're really that popular, it, it makes it so much easier to not be a jerk when you're like, this is how it's supposed to be. Because a lot of people just don't know how to circle swim. And if you have the sign that shows what it is, I think that works really well. Okay, good comment. I, I will uh, get on that. Thanks both of you. And the last issue is tennis. Somebody again asked me, especially with these hot days, remind me again when the tennis shelter at Quail, it's a budget item. And I think you guys said maybe next year. I want to be able to tell people when they ask me. That is Steve's. I'll let Steve jump in on that yeah, one. I, I, I don't know. Uh, the, okay. I do not have the current funding. It's not going to be next year. Okay. I'll um, say yeah, no, it's, TBD. It's, All right. It's something that... Um, just yeah that same woman patsy who came to our meeting last october and patsy. asked about backboards yes. yep. she asked me again is, is that yes. get in or what happened there unless david changes my priorities i have three priorities right now and that's not one of them okay and if there's a net that's a problem is there a phone or complaint line you know if a light goes out or what to remind me where, where do i go so, Jeff, do you have one for your guys? Because I, I do. We have the call center. Call, call center. center. I would, center. I would say you. the call center. Okay. Great. Thanks, Paige. I'm done. And, and do you want okay. that number for the call center? Sure. So that one is going to be the 303-651-8416. Thanks. Just to confirm, what call center is that? Sorry. So that goes to uh, Public Works Natural Resources. You have a great group over there that's pretty good at getting information to Timber and his group or Dan and his group. They they know our system pretty well. So it's one that you probably get the least amount of let me check. So if you go over there for things that are kind of follow that Public Works Natural Resources, um, it'll get to us pretty quickly that way. So this could be anything, a street light out, uh, a trail yeah. sign down. I mean, that's great yeah. to know. Potholes, all that sort of stuff. Yes, they'll take it all. Josh doesn't get picked different? up. Can you give the number one more time, 651 something? Yeah, 651-8416. 
8416. Is that also, I know, David, we talked about graffiti at one point. Is that the kind of place where I would just contact them for those kind of situations too? And I'm sorry. I, I said if there was like graffiti at a park, is that the kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, perfect. That's, yep, exactly. Okay. They will actually put that service request right in and go right to my guys pretty much automatically. Dan Wolfer? Yeah, I apologize, but I want to just jump right in and, and mention that we are moving into mosquito season and we will be starting our mosquito control program next Sunday. So just a reminder of, you know, the four D's and I'm certain you've all heard me spout about it before about dusk to dawn, you know, what you what to wear when you're outside during those times, long sleeves, light colored, loose clothing. Uh, make certain that you know standing water in your yard is being removed and then defend which you know is the use of a repellent but you know we're jumping right out of COVID and back into west nile so um, <laughs> just as a quick reminder thank you thanks dan there was a pretty significant tick season in there too so lots of fun always anything else from the board I have a Do question. Um, in the in the minutes, I know you talked about a possible rec center and kind of how to get going at the last meeting. And it said that um, Jeff was going to go to the next city council meeting with that. Did that happen or? No, what we talked about is that we are going to be working on a pro process to get feedback from the public on what the facility should be. And then it would go to city back to you as the board and then ultimately to city council. So are you, you creating a, a survey of some sort or what's the plan? Uh, we will be right. This last month has been all about getting reopened. So I haven't done anything with it yet. No, but that's sort of the idea is a, like a survey. Open survey and, and public meetings also. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions or other items? Paige, do you know if there's a chat mode I can drop this contact information in? And it's a pretty good link here. There's, there's not. We don't have chat, I don't think. So, okay. so yep, yeah, I'll just reiterate then. So maybe I'm, Aurora or Nikki could send it out. Okay. I have it, David, and I, it's in the notes of the, uh, the meeting. Okay. So I'll, it'll go out to everybody. All right, very good. Thank you. I had one last item, which was just that I love all the new trees that were planted in Willow Farm Park. I'm not sure who's responsible for that, but I would love to thank them because they look great. Thank you. That's awesome that you say that, Paige. I have not been down there, but uh, that was my first project with the city. And so those trees are some of the first that I located the plantings of. And now to see them mature like that over 23 years later, it's interesting to see that some die and there's a bunch place. of new ones now yeah, yeah 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 that's that's fantastic yeah i love that park okay anything else if not i think we're ready to go to adjournment so i just need a motion to adjourn i move we adjourn and i Wait, move we adjourn a second i'll oh, second Great, thanks. All those in favor? Awesome. We are adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all. Thank you. Stay cool Thank you. There. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, everyone.